I will do a quick introduction and then I will hand over to our guest of honor. Thank you for joining us today for, with, for a chat with Lucy Bellwood, an adventure cartoonist and artist at sea. My name is Logan Mock Bunning and I'm, I'm on the communications team for Schmidt Ocean Institute. We're excited to have an audience from all over the globe joining us as we talk about science and art, as well as living and working on research vessel Falcor during a mapping expedition. Before we get started today, a little bit of housekeeping. We love participation from everyone watching, so please ask questions. You can ask questions on the YouTube chat bar, the Facebook chat bar, and send us tweets over Twitter uh, with the handle at Schmidt Ocean and hashtag Artist at Sea. Please go ahead and post questions now or at any point during the talk. We'll be answering questions during a few spots as we go, as well as some time uh, set aside at the end for a Q&A. To get things rolling, a bit of background, the Schmidt Ocean Institute was established in 2009, strives to advance the frontiers of ocean research and exploration through technical innovation, operational support, and open sharing of information. One of the ways that we seek to do this and raise awareness and inspire people is with our Artists at Sea program. Like scientists, we believe artists conceptualize and put together ideas in new ways, and we hope to reach a new audience by sharing the story of science with new and unexpected mediums. So one of the people we chose to do that is a perfect fit, and her name is Lucy Bellwood. Uh, oh, she, is a tall, <laughs> she is a tall ship sailing uh, adventure cartoonist, and so I will let her take over and introduce herself. Cool. Thanks, Logan. Um, I'm so excited to be doing this. The trip that I took aboard Falcor was actually a couple years ago now. It was in early 2017. I flew to Guam at the start of the year, actually maybe late December. Yeah, because we celebrated New Year's at sea. And we uh, spent three weeks crossing the Pacific to do, um, it was actually a transit cruise. A lot of the time Falcor does different types of journeys. Some of them are explicitly science oriented. Some of them are just, we have to get the ship from point A to point B. And our particular trip, I think was the first time that a transit voyage had been sort of co-opted to do a little bit of science on the side. And I got to document the work that was being done on board in comics form. So um, that turned into this comic book, Mapping the Floor, which uh, one of the things I think is really cool about Schmidt and their mission is that all of the findings from scientists on board are made available to the public. And that includes the comic that I made. So Schmidt pays to print these and then gives them out. I think now we're into the thousands, by the thousands to people at um, ocean science conferences and uh, conventions around the world. And um, I've gotten to bring them to conventions and share them with school kids and stuff. And that's been incredibly cool. So uh, I'm going to do a little slideshow presentation about me and what I do with myself. Um, like Logan mentioned, I, I am the author of some other comics. One of them is this book, Baggy Wrinkles, A Lover's Guide to Life at Sea, which is about my previous life as a tall ship sailor. I worked on big traditional ships before I got into making comics. And uh, I'll show you some pictures of boats that I've worked on so you can get a sense for what those are like. So I'm going to share my screen here and um, we're going to go for it with the presentation. Hopefully you can all see that okay. Um, so this is me. Uh, I call myself an adventure cartoonist because I like to go on adventures and uh, then make comics about it. It's very straightforward, but it took me a long time to figure out that's what I should call myself. But now I think it encapsulates what I do pretty well. I have always been into tall ships. This is a rather rat-eaten uh, coloring book from <laughs> my childhood that I discovered recently when I was trying to track down like when I started being obsessed with traditional sailing vessels. And I thought it was in junior high. It turns out it was actually much earlier. Here's a paper that I wrote in fifth grade about uh, trying to build a boat. And uh, I <laughs> definitely, for, for 10, I think there's some good, some good writing for a 10 year old in here. Um, I, it's, it's, yeah. If there's anything on your boat that's paper, you need to laminate it. It's truer words never written. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I started drawing boats when I was really very young and continued drawing boats right up until I became an adult. This is the Lady Washington, my first tall ship sailing love. And I started uh, translating my adventures on tall ships into comics form. So um, I've sailed on a bunch of different vessels. This is the Oliver Hazard Perry, the Charles W. Morgan, the Irving and Exie Johnson, um, and the Hawaiian Chieftain down there on the right. And I loved sailing on these ships and I wanted to share that experience with other people. And so I started taking experiences like this of me up in the rigging and turning them into comics. This is actually a comic about sailing on the Charles Morgan, which is the last wooden whaling ship in the world. And I got invited to sail with them after they'd done this enormous $3 million restoration. And the ship was sailing for the first time in 90 years. It was incredibly cool. 
I've also done trips to do with not sailing things like uh, whitewater rafting through the Grand Canyon. There's me very small again, and you can see I'm turning this into uh, illustrated watercolor comics about my time out in the world. So all of this led to me being on Falcor because um, one of the crew members, uh, Colleen, was a backer of my book Baggy Wrinkles on Kickstarter, and she's another tall ship sailor. And I got an email from her saying, hey, I work on this big research ship. Would you be willing to come and join us um, for a trip? We have an artist at sea program. You can apply, but I've also kind of, you know, put a word in for you and I think you'd be a great fit. And so that was how I found myself uh, flying to Guam right after Christmas in 2016. I was very excited to be there. This is Falcor, um, a very different type of vessel from any of the ships I'd sailed on before. Obviously, there's far fewer sails, no sails, in fact. Uh, you can see that golf ball shaped protuberance in the middle of the ship, that satellite internet. There are two of those getting connectivity to the vessel. Um, and just like state of the art scientific research. I'm gonna pause and say, I am not a scientist, did not train to be a scientist. Uh, I don't really know very much about science. So this was a great opportunity for me to show up and learn a whole lot of stuff very quickly and then turn it into a comic that could be shared. I was thrilled to be there. Here we are with the world's longest selfie stick. That's me, I'm just gonna blow that up. Yep, super jazzed to be here, very exciting. This is me and the rest of the outreach team. So there were a lot of crew members on board who make the vessel run. And then there's also um, the science crew who are there doing their experiments. And then there was us, the outreach team. Um, this includes uh, the folks from 11th Hour Racing, which is a sailing advocacy organization, um, Jenna, who was a teacher. And then we also had some uh, graduate students as well. This is the bridge of Falcor. Again, I'm used to a vessel that you steer with an enormous stick and you just kind of point it where you want the ship to go. That's that's about as high tech as it gets. You have a compass and it's pretty exciting. This, on the other hand, is like the Starship Enterprise. It's incredibly high tech and also has so many windscreen wipers. It's really very impressive. Uh, and this is one of the things somebody asked me on Instagram before I started this presentation, um, was there anything I wished I could have done aboard Falcor that I didn't get to do? This is um, the remote operated vehicle uh, ROV Sebastian. It's like S-U-B, Sebastian, because the ship is named after Falcor. It's a never ending story joke and it's a bad pun and I love it. Um, a lot of the time when Falcor goes out sailing, uh, this is what they're after. They're doing these ROV dives and taking this little guy underwater and uh, capturing footage of things that people have never seen before. In fact, there's some very cool stuff that happened this week. Uh, the, the ship is out there right now and just captured footage of an incredible, enormous organism that uh, whose name I forget because it's all very new and exciting, but there's some very cool Twitter threads about it, which uh, maybe we can link to in the chat. So there were no um, submersible dives planned for our voyage. We were doing ocean floor mapping, which just uses the onboard uh, multi-beam sonar array on the ship. And I really, I regretted not being able to experience um, any of the, the footage coming back from this, this little guy, but um, he's very cute. Look at his little face, he looks kind of like Wally. So this is where we were, right? There's Guam uh, over on the left there. And uh, we were headed to Hawaii, um, but in the middle, the place that we were actually stopping to map was the Johnston Atoll. And I'll explain what an atoll is when uh, I read the comic. We're all gonna learn about this together. I'd never been to Hawaii, never been to Guam. Uh, this was a, a trip of firsts for me. This is what we were planning to map. It doesn't really look like much. This is a screenshot taken from uh, Google Earth that is pretty low resolution. But if you happen to download Google Earth and look at the surface of the globe, you'll notice that in the oceans, if you zoom in, there are these like lawnmower tracks of weirdly high resolution data for certain parts of the ocean and not for others. And I never knew why that was until this trip. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Here's uh, some of the mapping crew and there's Colleen in the, in the middle there. Um, who was responsible for me joining the vessel. So this is below deck in the um, control center where we were doing a lot of our mapping data gathering. And this is what the interface looks like. So it's very colorful and beautiful. And if you look at that bottom screen, you can see there are arrows, right? Delineating the path of the vessel. And basically what's happening is the ship is passing back and forth over the ocean floor like a lawnmower and trying to build up this fan shaped image of what's happening on the seafloor. Again, we'll talk about this more in the comic. And it ultimately ends up looking like this. You get something that's like a crisscross mishmash that hopefully eventually results in a proper 3D image of what is happening at the bottom of the seafloor, meters and meters and meters down. Very cool. Uh, I will say one thing that I, that I like about this and that brings it back around to being 
tall ship relevant uh is that this is the terra nova um a, a famous vessel that uh had been lost in the ice for many many years and it was actually discovered thanks to falcor um when they were doing one of these ocean floor mapping routines and uh the sonar started picking up stuff that was did not look like seafloor and it ultimately turned out to be the wreck of this vessel so i think there are some ways in which science and maritime history um many ways actually in which they intersect and that was just that tickled me um while i was on board i didn't have very much time we were doing an artist at sea gallery show for me and um, a handful of other creators who have been invited aboard falcor over the last few years and the gallery show was launching as soon as we got to Hawaii. So um, the goal was for me to have finished drawing the entire comic by the time we arrived. Um, it ended up being about 12 pages and uh, I did get it done in time, but I had to get to grips with the vessel very quickly. So I ended up doing um, a lot of sketches. You can see my, um, my cabin on the top left there, the library. Falcor is an incredibly well uh fitted out vessel it's like being in a very nice hotel at sea which is very different from the environments that i'm used to which are usually um a lot dingier and smellier and this was very uh very high tech and very slick and a lot of people asked too in in uh, the instagram query that i put out for questions how i ended up doing drawing while i was at sea it is difficult you might notice that there's a lot of hand lettering on these pages a lot of straight lines for all the panel borders uh, the ship, of course, is moving. It's rolling and tipping and pitching and whatever. There are stabilizers, but um, it's it's pretty pretty mobile. <laughs> um, so I learned to time my uh, pen strokes to the motion of the vessel. There are certain drawing exercises that I think it's uh, only possible to do when you're in a moving seaway, and it was difficult. Um, I also made an enormous use of non-skid shelf liner, which is a trick I picked up on tall ships, but it's very helpful for keeping all your stuff from just sliding right off the desk. So this is what the original pages looked like. You can see I was using in the bottom left there that plastic round device is called an Ames lettering guide. And that's a tool that cartoonists have used for a long time to rule even spaced lines for lettering. So you can see that's how the letters all come out looking so neat. Um, and I penciled the whole comic in blue pencil. And the reason the cartoonists do this is that if you use a colored pencil and then ink over it with a black pen, once you scan the art into Photoshop or a similar program, you can more easily just drop out the color and then you can get back to just having original black line art. If you draw with a regular graphite pencil, then you're asking a scanner to distinguish between kind of muddy gray colors for the pencil and black color for the, um, or color is the wrong word, but you know, black tones for the, the pen, muddy gray tones for the pencil, which really to the scanner is just different types of gray. So with the blue, it's a lot easier to drop it out and get nice clean art. Okay, so I think, yes, this is the comic. Um, we, are, we are into the comic part. I'm going to pause that for a second um, and come back here to see if we have any interesting questions that we can answer before I launch into actually doing comics reading. Oh, people always want to know about the food. I am going to talk about the food, but we're going to talk about the food after uh, I do the comic reading. <laughs> so Logan, do we have anybody uh, whoops, asking questions about what I've been talking about so far? I'm trying to do a better job in my presentations of pausing in my verbal uh, ramblings to give people an opportunity to ask questions. And your mic is muted just in case. Sorry about that. Yes. There you go. Uh, so one of the questions we had uh, on YouTube that I was trying to answer without interrupting you <laughs> was about how the, uh, the people manning the sonar, if they're in contact with the navigation. And uh, that is true. Uh, they are for two reasons. Um, like Lucy was talking about, a lot of what we are mapping has not been mapped before. So many times we set a course and aim to follow it. However, one of the nice things about getting immediate, somewhat almost immediate feedback is if something very interesting appears, we can adjust for that. So the Marine techs uh, manning the sonar are in touch with the bridge to one, confirm that they are on the right track, um, that they aren't swerving too much or that they're not going too fast. They're getting constant feedback about uh, both the direction that they're going and the quality of the imagery we're getting from it. Um, and then in case something actually surprising or you know, usually good, as, as, as Lucy mentioned earlier, the, uh, the wreck of the Terra Nova, when something like that appears, 
obviously there's a lot of communication because we need to figure out, hey, is this worth chasing? What is this? Is this dangerous? Uh, is this, you know, are, are the depths changing so quickly that we actually need to change navigation? Usually out, out at sea in these depths, that's not the case. But when you're closer into shore, um, there could be an unknown wreck or there could be debris or something like that. Um, so that's a long answer to yes, they're in constant contact for a very, uh, a couple of reasons. So uh, that was the last question I saw on YouTube. Do you see cool. anything you wanna take? Um, the stuff I have is a lot of people who, let's see, we answered, how did I end up as an artist at sea? Um, someone asked what my favorite part of the ship to draw was and what my favorite place to be was. Um, Falcor has, and we'll see this in the comic, uh, there's a thing called the monkey deck, which is a sort of the pinnacle, like up, uppermost part of the vessel where you can go hang out and it's, uh, there's hammocks up there. It's an amazing place to go and watch the sunrise. Uh, I spent a lot of time up there just because it affords absolutely unbelievable views of the ocean. And um, you're you're up high and there are there were some nights up there where um, it was late and I went on deck and you could just stand and be in the moonlight and feel the wind in your hair. It was super warm, right? We were in very um, pleasant latitudes for that. And there was a night where a, a brown booby came and landed on the railing, like, I don't know, maybe five feet away from my head. And I was just sitting there for the longest time with this enormous seabird. And we were both looking at the moon and it was very dramatic and lovely. And uh, I think watching watching the birds was like my favorite activity on board um, because, you know, you're in the middle of the ocean. It's surprisingly empty uh, up above, you know, you're kind of into, I think a lot of my um, sailing has been pretty near coastal. And so being in the middle of the ocean I wasn't really prepared with, they call it blue water sailing, right? Cause you're way far out away from shore that you're not seeing a lot of stuff. We, there were flying fish occasionally, which was very exciting. After a while you start to get like really attuned. If there's a bird, you're like, oh my God, a bird. <laughs> Have you guys seen this bird? <laughs> and it's very exciting. Um, and you know, because the ship is like a, a relatively stable surface out in the middle of nowhere, traveling seabirds will come and land sometimes on the, the navigational equipment or like various reading devices that are very sensitive. And that can be a problem that there's like, you gotta go shunt them off. But uh, on the whole, it was just really magical to see these beautiful creatures come and hang out with us for a little bit. It was very nice. Um, and then of course, when we're passing, uh, when we were passing other atolls in the distance, you could see increased bird activity. And that was one of the ways you could, you know, register that like you're close to land, even if you can't see anything on the horizon. Um, other we things, have a couple right? more that I can jump in. Oh on. yeah, great, go um, for it. A couple people have asked uh, about the artist C artist at C program if it's ongoing. Um, it is kind of obviously with everything that's going on with the 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 uh, pandemic right now, we've sort of paused on everything. Um, this last year in 2020, we were scheduled to be in Australia, um, and we are still there. Uh, what we will be doing as far as the planned expeditions is obviously sort of on hold. Um, but we have artists lined up for the current current uh, cruise schedule that we have in 2020. Um, and then usually what we do is at the end of the year, we open up uh, for a call. So if you follow us on uh, social media, we're at Schmidt Ocean on everything. Um, we will broadcast when we are taking, ex uh, taking applications and trying to get more folks involved on the Artist at Sea program. You can always check our website, which is www.schmidtocean.org. There's a button called that's labeled apply. You can click on that and see information. Um, but instead of constantly refreshing that, you can just sign up for our social media updates. Um, along those lines, someone asked if there were science uh, high school um, internships. The, the, I think the youngest person we can take on board is 18 uh, due to legal issues, uh, insurance and such. And so I believe we have had freshmen in college. I'm not sure, actually, I take it back. We did have some high school students from Australia on the last expedition. Um, uh, I apologize, his name is slipping my, my brain and I just actually talked to him and his mother the other day. I'm so sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, but so we have had high school uh, on board. Generally, it's something we do with undergraduates and graduates though. Um, anything else that you want to take on before I hand back um, for your- I should add, if people are thinking of applying for the Artists at Sea um, program and would like to look at uh, the proposal that I ended up putting together to submit, I'm always happy to share my application materials with anybody who wants to uh, get familiar with it. I personally, as a non-science person, um, 
found it a little intimidating. You can read the the experimental proposals from the scientists because the science teams apply for research time aboard Falcor, right? They're not a permanent part of the crew. So you get to read the scientists proposals. And then based on that, you have to craft an artist's proposal that sort of dovetails with the research that's being done. And if you're anything like me, you might read it and be like, I don't understand, I don't know, like a 10th of the words on this page. The rest of them are pretty dicey. Like <laughs> it's, it's hard to grasp like what the research is going to be. The, a lot of that became clear in time. And I would encourage people to not be intimidated uh, if you read the science and you're like, I don't know anything about science. It's okay. Falcor is a research vessel. The goal of the vessel is to share information with groups of people, both in and out of the scientific community. And that was what I really loved about it was that uh, everyone there was incredibly welcoming and um, really enthusiastic about the research they were doing and really keen to answer my many many repetitive silly questions <laughs> about um uh, everything i just i asked so many questions i think being an artist at sea especially if you're trying to craft something like the comic i did which is a little more straightforward factual less fine arts um you just have to be really comfortable with making a fool of yourself over and over again and the good thing is that nobody there is going to make you feel like a fool for asking questions so if anyone wants to apply and you're feeling stuck and you want a little bit of uh reference material please feel free to reach out to me. You can find me uh, on Twitter and Instagram. It's at Lou Bell Wu, L-U-B-E-L-L-W-O-O. -O. And my website is lucybellwood.com. You can email me from there, any of that stuff. I'm always happy to share materials with people. And so along those lines, I'm going to jump in again on that. Um, one, I want to say thank you to Lisa. She just informed me. She reminded me that the high school student's name was Liam. Thank you very much. I apologize, Liam. Um, it was wonderful having you on board. Liam actually helped a lot with our ROV team uh, on the last expedition as well. Um, and more information and background about the artist at sea can be seen on our website. You can go, uh, again, if you click on the apply button at the top, there is a section called artist at sea. You can not only see who the artists were and a gallery of their work, but we also have them, I think Lucy will get into this, we have them write blogs while they are on the, uh, the ship. And a lot of them talk about their process, about what they're learning, about the questions they have. Um, again, like, like Lucy just mentioned in somewhat a self-depreciating way, but it's true, like we want people to ask questions. That's the whole reason to have that there is a learning experience. If we had an artist come on board and just say, yeah, I know all this, thanks. I was just here for the food and the cruise. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be that, <laughs> not, that's not the goal. The goal is to get um, the artists and the scientists both thinking a little bit differently. A lot of times we find that the way artists talk about representing or the questions they ask actually helps the scientists flesh out more ideas and gives them more, uh, if not a better foundation, a different point of view to sort of view the work that they've been working on for years and years and years in a different prism or at a different angle. Um, so the questions are not, they're not a bug, they're a feature. We really do want this interaction between the scientists and the artists. Um, but to get back to my main point, there's lots of resources on the website of what previous artists have done. Um, so you can see Again, their thought process, their questions, and their final, somewhat, you know, no, 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 no work is final, but their final results that have gone into the various exhibits that Lucy talked about. Okay, I'll yeah. hand it back to you. One of the things that I found um, deeply unjust is that uh, the, the, I mean, I guess it's, it is the function of having uh, peer reviewed, you know, objective, serious scientific journalism. It's important to not put too much character into your writing, but it was such a tragedy to me because having read the proposal for what the research was going to be, it was very dry. And I was like, boy, this is, I've, I hope these people are fun. Um, and all of the science crew were so fun. They were so fascinating and so compelling and so enthusiastic about the work that they were doing. And it struck me as a huge injustice that they were not permitted greater leniency to be able to express themselves in the full extent of their character in their scientific findings. Um, so I felt like being able to do a comic about uh, a little bit of their, their zany energy was something that was uh, hopefully helpful to capture the real passion behind the research that they're doing, which sometimes can be inaccessible to people who just aren't as fluent in that kind of scientific jargon. So and I got to jump in real quick just yeah, to make sure that we don't limit what the scientists are saying. And in no, fact, no, not, not that it's Falcor's, um, right. not that it's Falcor's uh, call, just like the, the nature of science as an industry, I mean, right, or as a field is exactly. that, um, yeah. which is something I hadn't really grasped, like that there was, um, because I think we'd talked about it even explicitly at some point on the cruise being like, why, 
you're, you're waving your arms when you talk about this. Why can't you wave your arms in your paper? And they're like, well, that wouldn't be science. You know, you have to be like, you've got to be really precise about this stuff. Um, One of the so best I think, examples yeah. I can think of is uh, on your cruise, it was Jonathan Tree, who uh, the metaphors he had about crafting reading rocks as if reading historical volumes. Yeah. Um, and again, these are, these are blogs that are available on our website. Um, but it's the, the writings that are on our websites are not generally just the the dry scientific proposal but it's no and that's the better part yeah is that you get Um, to see and you hear from so the blogging maybe i'll talk about that a little bit before we get to the comic reading um all the members of the crew uh so all the science team and all the outreach team are encouraged to write blog posts and do little video updates while we're at sea um we had an amazing um like media communications officer monica who was with us who did um video and photography so we had incredible high quality images coming out of the trip and then people were i think every i don't know maybe twice a week we would write blog posts or maybe one a week um and you'd be encouraged to share your experience of being on board so i did a couple about what it was like standing watch with the science crew what it was like trying to get to grips with um drawing on board the vessel but the graduate student we had was doing research into coral reef regeneration. So there were different perspectives there. The 11th hour racing guys were talking about sustainability and sailing. So there was a lot of um, difference in perspective. And then the science crew, like Jonathan Tree also had the opportunity to write about um, their particular backgrounds. And I really, I did love that, that those blog posts were more, uh, I don't wanna say human, but like, you know, they had a little, a little more room for character. Um, but then also you can look at the science data as well. So it's like, it's the whole, it's the whole package. It's very exciting. Um, so yeah, let's read the comic, shall we? I think that would be fun. I'm gonna go back over to my screen share and start playing. So uh, the comic name that we came up with was Map on the Floor because I didn't have a lot of time to come up with anything more clever. This is a scientific high seas adventure. Hello there, I'm Lucy Bellwood, adventure cartoonist. I'm visiting research vessel Falcor to explore some of the science being done aboard this state-of-the-art facility. With a background in tall ship sailing, I'm no stranger to the ocean, but the research being done here is all new to me. So let's dive in and learn about it together. One thing I will say is super great about being an artist at sea on Falcor is that the organization has so many reference images of the ship. It is amazing to work for an org that has a professional photographic team who have just compiled tons and tons of images. I would not have been able to draw this comic without them. Thank you, many and various photographers. Named after the Luck Dragon in Michael Ende's The Neverending Story, Falkor was originally built in Germany in 1981. Since, oh my gosh, I put my video right over this. What is, I'm missing a word. Since her refit as a research vessel in 2012, Falkor has conducted science cruises all around the world. As a privately owned ship, Falkor is often outfitted with the latest technology and equipment, not to mention some of the best researchers in the field. Here's a tour of some highlights. So here's the ship. There's ROV Sebastian right at the end. That's the ship's own remotely operated underwater vehicle, which was just launched in 2016. Didn't actually realize it was that recent. There are hydraulic A-frame and J-frames, which are hydraulic lifts that help with loading and deploying equipment. There are exhaust pipes for the twin diesel engines, which allow the vessel to reach a maximum speed of 17 knots, which is 19.56 miles per hour if you're not used to doing things in knots. There are life rafts. There are inflatable structures that deploy in abandoned safety sh- or abandoned ship scenarios. Safety is taken very seriously by everyone on board. One of the best things we got to do was running a fire drill and operating a uh, fire extinguisher on the aft deck uh, to put out a barrel full of flaming rags that were in a controlled environment. Everything was very safe, but it was nice. I've never been part of a fire drill that's allowed people to actually practice utilizing a fire extinguisher on the wooden ships that I worked on. We always did it with um, seawater pumped fire hoses. And then, like I mentioned earlier, those two big golf balls, that's the VSAT internet. There are two antenna housed in large fiberglass domes, which provide unmatched high-speed internet at sea with real-time data streaming online from all of the ship's missions. So this is how Falcor is transmitting um, dive footage from Sebastian. It's how we were able to do ship-to-shore calls where we um, sometimes in the middle of the night would get up because of time zones to talk to students in the Dominican Republic, in the U.S., And it was great to do these classroom visits remotely, which of course now we're all doing all the time because uh, here we are living our lives on the internet in real time. And then at the front of the ship, there are those environmental sensors that I mentioned that sometimes birds come and perch on. So they capture everything from wind speed to water salinity to atmospheric pressure to vessel location. 
The overall length of the vessel is 82.9 meters. Its draft, the amount of space it takes up below the waterline is 5.8 meters. The beam is 13 meters. That's the distance across the vessel. And there are 42 berths. So that's the number of people who can sleep on board. Like I said, very spacious. Below decks, Falcor is a scientist's dream. The control room's wall of monitors allows the team to track stats all over the ship and below the surface. The wet lab is for examining specimens, checking equipment, and collecting and analyzing samples from the sea. Highly trained marine technicians stand ready to assist with data acquisition and processing. A transducer, a device designed to send and receive sonar signals mounted to a gondola on the keel, enables mapping of the ocean floor. This obscure location helps reduce interference from bubbles. A high-performance cloud computing system allows data storage and processing abilities never before available to scientists at sea. Falcor offers a truly unique opportunity for our collaborators, says Carly Weiner, communications manager. We give scientists free access to Falcor in exchange for open communication about our data and results. Everything we learn on board Falcor goes into the public domain free of charge. That's Colleen Peters, the lead technician who's responsible for me being on board. So that includes ocean currents, meteorological data, navigational readings, and fluorescence, which is levels of bioluminescent plankton in the water, my favorite. The data can help inform future areas of research and boost our knowledge of the oceans. This is Juliana Deal, marine tech intern. I got here by submitting a research proposal to join Falcor on this cruise across the Pacific, John Smith, who is our chief scientist, which brings us to our current mission, mapping the Johnston Atoll. So here's our science crew. We have Joyce Miller, mapping specialist, John Smith, chief scientist, and Jonathan Tree, marine geologist. This expedition science team is using multi-beam mapping to examine the seafloor in the Johnston Atoll. So here is the Johnston Atoll Unit, the JAU as we refer to it. It lies within the recently expanded Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. So you can see all of these little atolls and islands have boundaries around them. And that's the amount of space out from the original landmass that uh, is protected underneath this monument. A former US military base, Johnston is the closest land to Hawaii, 717 nautical miles away from Honolulu. A uh, tree? What is an atoll? I'm so glad you asked. Whoa. Coral colonies grow very slowly over tens of thousands of years up around the edges of subsiding volcanic islands in what's known as a fringing reef. So you can see the island and then the little corals growing up around the edge of it. As the central island erodes and the corals grow higher, a lagoon forms, making a barrier reef. This stage can take as long as 100,000 years to form. So the coral growth goes up, the subsidence goes down, and then this lagoon forms. Eventually, the island erodes below sea level and the lagoon covers it. The remaining circular formation is called an atoll. The overall time for this to happen is 30 million years. I cannot even wrap my head around it, it's so long. <clears throat> I already mapped Johnston Atoll proper back in 2006. Okay, well, I guess we'll map some seamounts near the atoll. A seamount is any formation greater than 1,000 feet above the seafloor. See, here they are. Ooh. But the ocean is huge. How did we know they were here in the first place? Satellites. If you've used Google Earth, you've probably seen that we already have some idea of the seafloor in these remote areas. Here's our current view of the mapping site. Remember we saw that earlier? Using radar altimetry, <laughs> satellites can detect minuscule bulges in the ocean surface that follow the topography of the seafloor. The bulges are a result of seamount's mass, which causes water to actually pile up atop them. This gives us a rough idea of what lies beneath the vast expanse of blue at the surface. Altimetry is from the Latin alti, meaning high, and Greek metria, meaning measuring. Makes sense, right? The satellite mapping can be like looking at a chair under a blanket. You know there's something there, but not much about it. Its shape, its texture, its material, its color, huh, don't know. But with multi-beam, it's a whole new level of detail. I've been working with multi-beam since it first came on the scene in the late 70s. Joyce is the queen of multi-beam. She has a track jacket made from a map of the ocean floor that she mapped, so cool. All right, so here's what I've learned. Multi-beam uses a sonar array to provide us with massive quantities of data about the contours of the seafloor. 
Here's how it works. The transmitter in the gondola sends out a ping, a fan of 432 beams that cover a swath of terrain. The echo of that ping bounces off the seafloor, returns to the receiver, and gets turned into data. As the ship tracks back and forth, it gathers a seamless data set. The science team then collects and cleans up the data, taking out rogue pings and filling holes. Finally, the data is used to generate a three-dimensional visualization of the seafloor. This area of study is called bathymetry. Bathos is not, in fact, an ancient Greek term for bathtub, but an adjective meaning deep or profound. Much of the JAU has not yet been mapped or explored, but the region is a hotbed of biodiversity. Our data will help future teams plan more focused dive missions with ROVs like Sebastian. Our total mapping goal is 7,000 kilo square kilometers, which means the science team will work, will be standing watch around the clock. So here's the watch rotation. There's one group of people who's on from midnight to 8 a.m., one from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., one from 4 a.m. to midnight. The ships operate on 24-hour military time. Fact sheet, danger alert. The JAU lies within the prime crust zone, or PCZ. The PCZ is an area of very rich cobalt crust formations. Cobalt crusts are rich in rare earth minerals used in disk drives, fluorescent lamps, and rechargeable batteries, which could make these areas a target for mining in the future. Similar mining efforts may go after manganese nodules. These small hamburger-like structures are also rich in rare earth minerals. They congregate in these, I'm just going to pause for a minute here because this was so cool to learn about. They form and congregate in these underwater planes where it's just like tons of these little hamburger-sized boyos laid out on the ocean floor for miles around. It's wild. They form in vast underwater fields in an adjacent region of the North Pacific known as the Clarion Clipperton Zone. I also keep one in my fridge. Mm, souvenirs. Once it's processed, all our data goes back into the public domain. This gives scientists and casual Google Earthers alike a more detailed view of the region. So our research literally changes the way people see the world. Exactly. We want everyone to know more about these extraordinary environments. And awareness is the first step toward conservation. So you can learn more about what we found by going to schmittocean.org slash cruises. And that's where you can find all of the um, blog posts that we had from the team and uh, what everybody had to say about their time on board. Now, at long last, here's the image that we came up with. This is um, the seamount that we mapped, one of the seamounts that we mapped. I was saying that I had a really hard time grasping some of the science that was going on. Um, even when we had started mapping, I was still having a hard time wrapping my head around how we were compiling and cleaning up the data. But I have to say that as a cartoonist, as a visual thinker, when I first saw this image start to come together with this actual topographic elevation, everything clicked into place. I realized this was a perfect cruise for me to be a part of because it was so visual in nature. So this is the elevation map that we ended up with. And here is the noise that we used to generate kind of the surface texture that's overlaid on there. And that was what we ended up with, which I think is just so incredibly cool. Uh, and finally, we're going to talk about the food. This is the roast suckling pig that we had. The food was incredible. Our chefs were unbelievable. I ate better than I eat on land. The entire time I was at sea, we had fresh vegetables during the whole voyage. I spend a lot of time educating people about food conditions on sailing vessels in the 18th century. It was not like this at all. So that's what I have to say about that. Um, and now we're going to go back to the screen time. Here we are. Here are our faces again. So that was the comic. Uh, let's see if we have any questions that popped up while I was reading it. I will check uh my other I'll jump in while you're doing things that. yeah uh, lay, it, lay it on we, me we often get uh questioned about the food um obviously lots of people have different preferences with food and uh our chefs are cool are, are wonderful at tailoring different things to different people so uh one of the best ways to keep a crew happy and comfortable and doing good work is to have food so um we have uh our chefs We'll make custom meals for people that are vegetarian, that are pescatarian, that have gluten allergies, different food allergies. Um, it's a very active process uh, to keep to keep folks nourished and uh, and able to continue working with things. So you're not going to be forced to eat pork if that's not your deal. Um, we have lots and lots and lots of options of different different aspects, um, and that's one aspect that I would kind of like to talk about just really quickly, Lucy. Um, one of the things that I think people are often surprised to learn about in these conversations is that when you talk about a research vessel, I think a lot of people tend to think of 
a scientist in a white robe, you know, with with uh, beakers and things, sort of stereotypical microscopes and such. But in order to make this happen, um, it takes a very, very wide variety of people to do this. So we always want to be very grateful to our crew. We have uh, captains and, excuse me, one, one captain at a time, but we have uh, officers and we have deckhands and we have engineers who keep things running. We have the marine techs who sort of interface between the ship and the science. We have hospitality, we have cooks, um, we have uh, ETOs, which are electrical officers. Uh, basically a ship is a small town at sea. So a lot of times when I'm talking to schools, I say, hey, you know, you think about this classroom and your classmates, you take that out to sea and everything that you have to maintain here at school, plumbing, electricity, computers, air conditioning, food, beds, you know, I mean, everything, we have to continue doing that. So one of the things that I like to sort of bring up to folks is that if you are interested in having a career at sea and working for, with science at sea, you don't necessarily have to be a scientist. Um, I'm a communications officer, Lucy is an artist. There are lots of ways to take your interests and your talents and your knowledge and apply it to science at sea. So I hope if anyone is at all interested in that, it's another section we have on our website um, with, with careers at sea, look into that. Uh, doing science at sea is a, is a huge, huge team effort. And so we really encourage people to be a part of it in any way that fits with their personality. I know that's a bit of a detour, so I'll hang No, that's a great really point. Good, and I think- yeah. People always ask me, um, both to do with tall ship sailing and from this voyage specifically, if I can speak to the experience of being a woman in a traditionally like male dominated field. And I would say that one of my favorite things that happened on this voyage was um, a ship to shore call we did with a classroom where we specifically got all of the female um, science crew, all of the uh, marine techs, all of the arts and education people. And we all got together and did a call and the students in the classroom did an exercise where they, before the call, um, drew what they thought a scientist looked like. And they all pretty much universally, they sent us the images afterwards and then we did the call and then they drew them again after the call. And the before and after images were like, the initial drawing was exactly what you're describing. It was like a man in a white coat, holding a beaker, wearing goggles. That was the scientist. And afterwards we had introduced them to Joyce, who's an incredible mapping expert. We'd introduced them to people who were out in the field waiting around collecting fish samples. They introduced them to me, like there were this, there was such a wide variety of illustrations after we had given that classroom presentation and it just made my heart grow eight sizes because I think a lot of this is, um, it's just to do with visibility, right? It's the, these changes are already happening. Never at any point did I feel um, uncomfortable or out of place uh, because of my gender on board Falcor or, or indeed in other vessels. It's, it's traditionally been a place where I've really appreciated that the concern is far less to do with um, whatever your gender presentation might be and far more to do with how willing you are to be a member of a collective, how willing, how willing you are to help your shipmates and to put the vessel's needs ahead of your own in a healthy way, right? Like to be part of something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. And it's one of the things that I find so magical and transformative about working on a crew in any context. And Something that I also loved about being on board Falcor is that we had a series of um, lectures from various member or like community talks from people on board the vessel. And that wasn't just scientists talking about their research background or me talking about my creative work. We got to hear from the chefs and like we went on a tour and they told us how they keep vegetables fresh at sea for three weeks in an enormous refrigeration container, which is incredibly cool. Um, we talked to engineering. We got to hear about how they work on the vessel to make sure that it stays moving at all times. It was just incredibly neat to get to see all these different parts of how the ship was run. Um, and that was one of the things that I loved about it the most because it wasn't just like, hey, you're here in a floating science lab and you might as well be at home for all of the contact you have with the ocean. It was like, you're still very much a part of this very particular marine environment, which was super cool. All right, do we have any other queries? Other things we can answer while we're We had a quick up? question from, uh, I believe it's Lena, L-E-N-A, she's seven. And she asked if they grow plants on the ship. Uh, my answer was there are occasionally small sort of plots uh, that are, that uh, we grow herbs and things on, but you have to be really careful because there's a lot of sea spray. Um, so it's generally, you have to have small hardy plants that can be sort of harvested quickly or taken inside um, because if we hit rough, rough water, um, there you can have a lot of spray on there. So it's not like we have huge gardening plots um, full of, of, of things on the ship. Um, the chefs are really, really good at food preparation and storage. Um, they can somehow make vegetables 
stay fresh for up to five weeks. And I have no idea how they do that because it Wizardry. doesn't taste frozen or anything there. It's wonderful. Wizards. So yeah. it's part of the trade secrets, but I hope that answers your question. Uh, uh, Lena or Lena, I'm not sure. Yeah, salt oh, water is not so good for growing plants. Same is true for electronics too. Um, there's a lot, of, especially at this part of the globe, there's a lot of humidity in the air. Somebody asked on Instagram, how salty was the air? And you know, there may have been a scientific instrument that was measuring the salt content in the air. Certainly it was measuring salinity in the water, but um, I'm not so sure about in the air. But I will say that everything, if you come up on deck in the morning, everything is covered in a really fine coating of salt crystals from the evaporating seawater and the spray. And so that can get inside your electronic devices. So you have to be really careful if you're using a laptop, say, which we were a lot. I think that was something that was surprising to me is I usually associate being at sea with totally disconnecting from technology and being aboard Falcor was actually like, oh, you know, if you have downtime, you're working on your blog or you're doing ship to shore calls or you're doing research for the comic. And so I found that I was still on my device a lot, but I tried to limit the amount that I was using it on deck so that I wasn't um, exposing it too much to saltwater damage. All right. So one other quick question that I, I just responded to a comment on YouTube, but someone asked who pays for the vessel? And that's a very good question. Um, our founders are Eric and Wendy Schmidt, uh, and the, the organization is a nonprofit. Um, sometimes we get, we get some surly people on, uh, on our live streams that are asking uh, why their tax dollars are going to pay for this. And the answer is they're not. Um, we are actually a private foundation that is funded by some very generous benefactors who want to advance technology and um, oceanographic research. So they're doing it out of their own pockets. Um, I posted a link up to our story, the Schmidt Ocean Institute uh, uh, story on our website. So you guys can look up more information about that. And then I also saw, let's see, James Driscoll asked if the night skies are good for stargazing at sea. Um, I will, I'll quickly jump in and say it depends on the conditions. However, there have been sometimes, like Lucy was saying, we're generally very far away from shore. So light pollution is not an issue. Um, the depends on the, the weather and the cloud cover, but often it is absolutely amazing stargazing. In fact, one of the things we like to, to sort of point out to folks who haven't been on the ship before is, if possible, when we can see the International Space Station zooming above us, we'll say actually the closest people to us on the, uh, uh, the closest people to us are actually in space because we're so far out to sea that you know we're, we're hundreds and hundreds of miles, if not more uh, out to sea and the space station is actually in orbit. So it's, it's closer to us than anything. Um, bit, of a, bit of a sidetrack there, but- I really wish sure someone had said that were. to me while I was on board, I would have flipped out. That's so cool. I had never thought about it that way. It, yeah, um, it, it, it depends on where you are and if there are other vessels nearby, but it's very sure. possible that the closest humans to us are actually on space or on another vessel. Um, yeah. How are the conditions for you at, at night? You mentioned going out the, the monkey. Gosh, they, they were gorgeous. I mean, we had incredible weather um, the whole way across. There was some swell. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, completely smooth sailing the whole way there. And I think we had to do a little bit of maneuvering to kind of uh, get past some really rough see oh this is something i never remember to answer people ask all the time that they're like gosh it must be so great to not get seasick i totally get seasick tons of sailors get seasick uh if people who don't are lying to you everyone does sometimes it just it happens sometimes it's really calm and suddenly you're like Whoop, bleh. and other times it's uh you get only you know seasick in rough weather sometimes it's um seasonal who knows uh, I took a lot of medication um, because I had a job to do and <laughs> there were days, you know, usually in the past when I've been on longer vessel trips, um, it is bad the first few days and then my body kind of acclimatizes and I get used to it. I, but I do just get motion sick. I think it attests to how much I love the sea that I just go anyway. And I think there's something about it that's kind of like childbirth. Like you forget how bad it is until you're already out there again. And then you're like, God, why would I do this to myself? <laughs> but um, I was fortunate enough to get some very good non-drowsy seasickness medication that had no negative side effects, which was amazing. Um, and I did really want to not be taking it. You know, I was just like interested in what the experience would be like without it. But because I had to do um, comics while I was at sea, I couldn't really slack off and just be like, well, I don't feel like it today. Um, usually I would wake up in the morning and I would take a pill first thing. Sometimes I would not take one and see how I did. And most of the time I'd be like, nope, that's if I want to draw comics today, I'm going to have to take the pill. So I took the pill. Um, but everybody on board, you know, experienced crew members and regular uh, folks alike, the first couple days out, there was just a lot of naps, 
a lot of people lying around looking really green, not very much food consumption going on. And then most people kind of come right after the first few days. But yeah, on the whole, the weather conditions were incredible. There were only a couple of days where it was so rough that I couldn't draw. Um, and that's generally when the ship, the rolling is not so bad. It's the the thudding. It's when you're motoring into um, a seaway that's kind of coming right at you on the nose. And that can make it really like every time the ship is just smashing into a wave, you're getting jarred and jarred and jarred. And it's hard to draw any kind of line. But the swell can actually be conducive. I think if you're trying to draw a long straight line to just, if you time it just right, you can kind of uh, um, down down and up with the vessel. But yeah, the, the nighttime skies were unbelievably beautiful. Uh, I feel like I've already said, oh, my favorite part, but my other favorite part, my other other favorite part of being on board was uh, getting to run up first thing in the morning. Because a lot of the time in our cabins, we did have portholes, but if the swell was high, we were asked to keep them closed just for safety. And you don't want, they're big, heavy metal covers. So you don't want them swinging down and crushing anybody's fingers or anything like that. So usually you wake up in the dark and getting to scurry out of bed and up on deck like that first breath of morning air to find out what kind of sunrise you're going to get what the air feels like was just amazing. Um, and it was probably the best part of every day was scampering on deck and getting to see what was there. Folks who are here from um, my posts about this on Twitter or Instagram will probably see that I took a series of videos out the porthole in the galley every morning. And these, those actually ended up being infinitely more popular than the comic. Uh, people were just incredibly excited to see these sort of mesmerizing videos of the water flowing past the porthole, as was I. I mean, it was an incredible view. So uh, I'm, I've been posting those on Twitter. I'll keep going for the rest of the week until I run out of videos because I find them very calming. I think it's a nice thing, especially in times like these, to just look at the ocean and uh, remember that it's still out there. Indeed, that's that's a, a, a presence for us all uh, and hopefully calming for us all. We are kind of running low on time. Are there any sort of closing remarks you want to give to sort of wrap things up? Oh, gosh. Um, it's such a cool thing that this exists. I, <laughs> I'm just so grateful that I had the opportunity to go. And I'm really delighted that the comic, we've reprinted it twice now, I think. And um, the notion that we've been able to give out so many copies of this to people and that somebody in the Instagram comments was like, oh yeah, I found out about your work because I was writing a paper about the thymetry and I found you because of that. It's like, this is so cool. It was really, I, I think uh, traditionally the work that I've done has had to do with making history more accessible to people and doing something that was on the opposite end of that spectrum and making modern uh, science, you know, cutting edge stuff available to the public was incredibly cool in a completely different and unanticipated direction. So it's been really neat just through being a part of this to gain more familiarity with the science art community, with this whole, not just the other people who did, um, I don't know, mapping stuff or science on other voyages and meeting all the other artists at the gallery show at the end when we got to Honolulu was amazing, but even this broader community online. And it's something that I love about Schmidt's mission is that, um, we are now connected in so many more ways than we have been historically and getting to see the way that people are tuning into Sebastian live streams, turning in, tuning into stuff like this, getting to see what's happening on the ship in real time is so neat. And I'm so glad. I'm so grateful to all of you who tuned in to watch this. Um, we did, I think I did an artist at sea talk from the ship and we had some sort of technical difficulty while I was actually on the cruise. So I woke up at whatever o'clock in the morning and did this whole hour long talk. And then it turned out that we hadn't actually managed to connect the live stream. Um, so I'm really, I've, I've done follow-up streams since then. And it was, it's just, it's great to work with people who are so flexible because we all understand that, you know, the internet at sea is really spotty. Um, it can be hard to like, it's high speed and it's high quality, but you're also in the middle of the ocean. There's only so much you can do. So I, I really appreciated being a part of an organization that was so cutting edge and also like understood the, the trials and tribulations of trying to make this work in extenuating circumstances. And I think those are skills that all of us can really lean on right now while we're trying to adapt to living life in an increasingly digital world. So yeah, thanks for bearing with us. Uh, if there were any hiccups on your end, hopefully there weren't. It sounds like everything went pitch perfect. So that's great. Thank you for your questions. Um, like I said earlier, if you want to keep up with uh, stuff that I'm working on, the best place to do that is either social media, 
You can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Lou Bell Wu. I also fund all of my adventures through Patreon, which is a communal crowdfunding platform where people give me a little money every month in exchange for getting to see the background of my process, new work that I'm putting out. I'm still making nautical comics. So if you're into this kind of stuff, you can find me at patreon.com slash Lucy Bellwood. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any questions about what Schmidt's doing, again, please reach out to us. We're on uh, all sorts of social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, all with at Schmidt Ocean. Um, Incredibly responsive too, I should say. Logan's we, we there answering be, your sure. questions day in and day out. <laughs> and uh, and along with that, there are on, the, on our website, uh, SchmidtOcean.org, there's the archives of all these things. You can go back and again, see the blogs that Lucy worked on. You can see the expedition she was on and hear from the scientists as well. You can look at other artists at sea who have been part of the program, um, all sorts of things. Like I said, the expeditions that we have planned for this year, a lot of them are in flux right now, um, but the best way to keep up with what we're doing is to follow us on social media where we'll have lots of different updates. During the this, um, this presentation, uh, I put a couple of the uh, links to some of the output um, that Lucy worked on. We have a video that is an animation about seafloor mapping. Um, we have a couple of, uh, she mentioned Gina um, being the teacher that was on her expedition. Um, Jenna, excuse me. Um, she, uh, we have her lesson plans. Um, there are lots of different resources um, under uh, on our website under the, uh, the education aspect um, and the apply aspect. So um, please come to our website, check these things out, and follow us on, on social so we can have more of these conversations and have more question and answer. Um, I wanna again, thank you very much for your time, Lucy. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Logan. This was great. And thanks everyone right. for watching. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.